What does a true warrior look like? That's the theme I'm going to cover today with Bad Batch Season 1, Episode 12, Rescue on Ryloth. Overall, I really like this episode. I thought it was fun, engaging, and the writing was fantastic. The dialogue and nonverbal language made the story extremely compelling. I'm Nate, and this is my YouTube channel. If you like the content in today's video, make sure to hit the like button or leave a comment to let me know your thoughts. Episode 12 was released on July 16th, 2021 on Disney+. Plus. In this episode, Hera sends a distress call to the Bad Batch to ask for help in getting her parents out of captivity. The mission is risky and the stakes are high, but the guys decide to help. The episode is directed by Nathaniel Villanueva, who's directed five episodes of Bad Batch now, and the script was written by Jennifer Corbett, who's a producer for the Bad Batch series. So far, she's written four episodes of The Bad Batch, and with this episode, she definitely earns her pay as a writer and producer with the series. The episode starts off on Ryloth, where Admiral Rampart, with Captain Hauser in tow, visits Cham Sindula in a detention facility. Cham is being held with his wife, Eleni, and Gobi Glee. Admiral Rampart attempts to manipulate and taunt Cham into giving him Hare's location, but Cham is indignant, so Rampart tries to manipulate Eleni, but she is less diplomatic and tells Rampart she has seen how he treats his allies and she prefers to be his enemy. The last shot we see is of Captain Hauser appearing to ruminate on his loyalties. He is clearly bothered by the fact that his friends are now considered enemies. Out on the docking bay, Rampart tells Hauser to search the entire planet if he has to, but he must find Hera. Hauser objects to how the Twi'leks are being treated, and Rampart repeats the narrative that Cham and his fighters attacked the Empire and attempted to kill Senator Ta. Hauser pushes back. He saw what everyone else saw. Cham did not shoot Senator Ta. Keeping true to his toxic style of leadership, Rampart feigns ignorance of Hauser's claim and asks who shot Senator Ta if it wasn't Cham Sindula. Hauser has no idea that it was actually Crosshair. Throughout the season, we've gotten to know Rampart, and we know that he is a shady person. The thing here that drives this idea home is the dialogue. If anyone has ever worked for a toxic leader, Rampart's words here are spot on. Rampart is making Hauser consider the idea that it's not Rampart that's the problem, it's actually him. He's the crazy one. We saw Hauser's hesitation in the first scene, and now we can sympathize with him because his boss is like any terrible boss we've experienced. We also see more of Rampart's devious nature. Here we get a sense for just how cutthroat he is. He is a true believer, so much so that he's willing to sacrifice his own integrity for the sake of the Empire. It's hard to imagine that he'll get anything significant in return though, but with most toxic leaders, the return on investment is ego and the privileges of being part of the inner ring. The downside is that they grow a lot of enemies, and someday they will die at the hand of another toxic leader. I have no doubt in future seasons, Rampart will be taken out, probably by Tarkin. From her perch overlooking the palace compound, Hera watches Crosshair's squad as they finish searching the palace. She knows they are looking for her, and she decides to head to her hideout to send a transmission for help. On the Havoc Marauder, the guys receive a distress call from Hera. Though they are reluctant to take Hera's word that she is in serious trouble, Omega speaks up for her. Tech attempts to dismiss the claim as children sometimes overreact, but Omega, having now experienced life in the galaxy herself, thinks otherwise. She feels she is experienced enough now to see the galaxy honestly. Hunter tells Omega that they can't put their lives on the line every time someone is in trouble, to which Omega responds, isn't that what soldiers do? This statement makes two points. The first point is that it's an active move by Omega to move the story forward. This means that the episode belongs to Omega. She is going to drive the story, grow the most, and force others to grow with her, which will mainly be Hunter and Hera. The second point that this makes is that it states the theme of the episode, which seems to be a conversation on what real soldiers look like, or rather, what does a true warrior look like? And we get several dichotomies in this episode that explore this. We get Hunter and Crosshair, Hunter and Rampart, and Omega and Hera. With Hunter and Crosshair, both men are being challenged by another. Hunter is being challenged by Omega to be empathetic, and Crosshair is being challenged by Rampart to be unempathetic. In a conversation on YouTube between former Special Forces operator Tim Kennedy and former Navy SEAL Mike Sorelli, Kennedy asks several questions about what a warrior is. Sorelli talks about restraint and summarizes that a warrior is someone who has empathy on a dimmer switch. 
They know when to ramp it down to get the mission done, but they also know when to ramp it up. Hunter is learning how to apply empathy because of Omega, as well as for her. Crosshair is being forced by Rampart to do the opposite, to remove all empathy regardless of the situation. Rampart is doing this by challenging Crosshair's loyalty and calling his competence into question. The foil that sets the standard for what a warrior looks like in this pair of episodes is Hauser. He's battle-hardened yet empathetic. In the last episode, he had no problem with his men arresting Hera for spying on the refinery, but he was also willing to let it slide, and he is incredibly bothered by the treatment of the Twi'leks. With Hunter and Rampart, it's similar, but from the perspective of leadership. Rampart has a lot of power, but has very little restraint. As a result, Hauser constantly appeals to Rampart to exhibit restraint and have some empathy for the people of Ryloth. Hunter has all the restraint in the world, but he's being asked to let loose a little. What both men are being confronted with is the quality of meekness, which we'll get to in a moment. With Omega and Hera, we see one, Omega, who is thrust into the reality of the galaxy she didn't know was around her, and she's come a long way. The other, Hera, is in a place where Omega once was. We know where Hera is going though, so we can only imagine that Omega is on a similar track and will one day become a warrior like Hera becomes in Star Wars Rebels. As stated, the episode belongs to Omega. She's been through a lot and has learned about the galaxy, war, family, and doing what's right. We know and the guys know that going to Ryloth is the only answer. So they go to meet with Hera, who is hiding out in her father's old command outpost. Hera thanks them for coming and states that her father, Cham Syndulla, has been arrested along with her mother. Tech recognizes who her father is and the role he has played for Ryloth. Hera pleads with the guys to help her. The Empire is targeting anyone who even supports her father. Hunter asks what she wants them to do and she responds to free her parents. Hunter says he can't promise anything, but they'll take a look at what they're dealing with. In the Lesu City Square, Rampart steps out on the balcony to address the people. True to his manipulative nature, he tells the people he is also shocked by the assassination attempt on Senator Ta. However, the senator will make a full recovery. We know from the last episode that the people could care less about Senator Ta. They want Sindula to lead them. Rampart knows this, but the totalitarian state will always attempt to gaslight people into the narrative they want them to believe. Overlooking the event, the guys listen in. Harris states that her father did not try to assassinate Senator Ta. Rampart is not telling the truth. Then Omega notices Crosshair, to which Hunter and the guys go off to talk things over. The plasma bridge into the city has been deactivated, so no one can get in or out. Tech notes that the troop level is similar to Raxus, which indicates an occupation rather than a mere Imperial outpost. Then Hunter senses something. An Imperial probe droid is watching them. He destroys it, but it's clear the Empire knows they are there now. Back in Syndulla's old command post, Hera wonders why this is happening. Her youthful innocence has been challenged the past few days, and she's being forced to see the galaxy for what it is. But she is still reluctant. She says that she just wants her parents back. This is Hera wishing, like any youth does when confronted with the reality of life, that she could go back to the way things once were. Hunter states that the element of surprise is gone, and the best they can do for Hera is to get her off world. Hera counters with an offer to double their money, but Hunter sticks to his guns. It's too risky. Omega jumps in and reminds Hunter that Hera is trying to save her family, something she'd do for the Bad Batch. Here we see Omega's femininity and how it is starting to impact the guys. They view everything as a mission and weigh the risks. She's teaching them compassion and empathy, an inherently feminine task. Previously, they've been confronted with situations that require their compassion and empathy, but the choice often comes down to needing money or needing to pay off Sid, or to save one of their own. Rampart lectures Hauser about rounding up Syndulla's supporters. Hauser again reiterates that rounding up peaceful citizens will come at a cost, an uprising. But Rampart is indignant. Anyone who uprises will be arrested as well. Peace comes at a cost. Crosshair is waiting inside Rampart's office. He tells Rampart that Clone Force 99 has been spotted near the capital. Rampart is unfazed though. He's more worried about finding Hera and Crosshair has failed to produce her. This scene is a mirror image of the previous scene. Both Hunter and Rampart are being evaluated here. 
In both cases, each leader is presented with a problem of compassion that requires attention. Both men are asked to have empathy. In Rampart's case, he is asked for two things. The first is to loosen his grip on the people, and the second is to give attention to Clone Force 99 over Hera, who represents the immediate threat to his power. Both leaders want to resist compassion and empathy and stick to the objective. For Hunter, it's to keep his team alive and get to the next mission. For Rampart, it's to advance the reach of the Empire and his own power. Again, when we talk about restraint and empathy, the element we are talking about is meekness, or power restrained. Meekness is a warrior with his hand on his blaster, ready to pull a trigger, but restrained from doing so. He is calm and willing to assess the situation. Hunter has spent years practicing restraint, as well as dialing down his restraint to accomplish the mission but now he's being challenged to assess in terms of empathy too. Rampart and Crosshair have no restraint at all, nor do they have any interest in practicing it. Back in the outpost, Omega confronts Hera. She tells her that Hunter will come around. Hera is skeptical that Omega knows Hunter enough to believe he'll help. Then Omega tells Hera that Hunter is her brother. All the guys are her brothers. Hera tells Omega that she is lucky to have so much family but she still questions Hunter's ability to change his decision. Omega brings up the idea of being strategic. This reference is obviously trying to make a connection with Episode 9, Common Ground, in which you find out that Omega is a strategist. But I think it's kind of hokey here. What's really at play is Omega's feminine impact on the guys. Whether she knows it or not, she has impacted them in positive ways with feminine compassion. Hunter is going to respond positively, not because it's strategic, but because he has been slowly learning what it really means to be a warrior, to have empathy on a dimmer switch, and to practice the quality of meekness. In the detention facility, Hauser visits Cham and Eleni. He pleads with them to tell him where Hera is. He's on their side. He wants to protect her. But Cham does not believe him. He trusted Hauser before and then saw him follow the Empire. Cham will not make the same mistake of trusting Hauser again. At this point, we can see that Hauser is the epitome of a true warrior, He's battle-worn, battle-scarred, yet empathetic. He's the warrior that Hunter and Crosshair need to be, and the leader that Hunter and Rampart need to be. Back at the outpost, Hera and Omega pitch their plan to attack the refinery in order to draw Imperial forces away from the capital so the rescue team can get Hera's parents out. Hunter thinks for a moment. He's in. It's a good plan. And Hera has done her work gaining intel on the refinery. Tech is surprised that Hunter is willing to let Omega and Hera be their own team, but we know that Hunter learned previously that Omega isn't just dead weight. She's a member of the team too, and he's learning to trust her. She did well while the guys were on Raxus. He can trust her here. At the refinery, Chopper inserts with a shift change. His goal is to deactivate the cannons overlooking the refinery so Tech and Wrecker can fly in and destroy them. Omega and Hera conduct an overwatch. Chopper gets to the control panel, but he can't deactivate the cannons. So Omega hatches a branch plan to steal one of the Imperial troop transports so they can blast the control console offline. At the capital, Hunter and Echo scale the city wall and get inside. Back at the refinery, Omega and Hera commandeer an Imperial transport. Hera notes that her parents would never approve of the plan, to which Omega says she won't tell. At this point, we see a drastic difference between the Hera we saw at the start of the last episode. She was daydreaming of a fantasy life, flying and living aboard a spaceship. But she wasn't active. Now she's active. Though Omega is still leading, Hera is somewhere between the innocent young girl she started as and the rebel leader she will become in Star Wars Rebels. Tech asks Omega if they've deactivated the cannons yet, but they haven't. Omega tells Tech not to shoot down their shuttle, which surprises Tech. And at this point, we see the girls stepping out on their own beyond what the adults in their lives had let them. For Omega, Tech wouldn't let her fly until she knew all the systems by memory. For Hera, her uncle wouldn't let her land or take off until he was comfortable with it. Hera's takeoff is a bit rough, but she eventually gets airborne, and she creates the diversion needed. They rescue Chopper and destroy the power for the guns. With this, both girls are being initiated into the galaxy here. Tech flies the Havoc Marauder into the canyon where the refinery sits while Wrecker shoots all the cannons out. Back in the capital, Hauser notifies Rampart that the refinery is under attack. Rampart seems to be annoyed with Hauser. Here we see how good Dave Filoni's team has become. 
We don't need to hear what's on Hauser's mind, because we can see it on his face. There is a rift growing between Hauser and Rampart. Rampart tells Hauser to stay and guard the capital. He'll take care of the refinery. In the detention facility, Hunter and Echo show up and release Cham, Eleni, Gobi, and the others. No one knows who Hunter and Echo are except Gobi. He states they are mercenaries, but he didn't hire them. Hunter notes that Hera did, and Cham wants to know if Hera is safe. On the stolen Imperial troop transport, Hera is getting better at flying the vessel, while Tech is still confused by her erratic movements. Again, this is fantastic writing. In Rebels, Hera is a stellar pilot, but right now she has a lot to learn. She has room to grow in future episodes and series. Back at the capital, Crosshair realizes that the target is not the refinery, but rather the detention facility. The refinery is just a decoy. Hauser watches from a balcony as Crosshair's team pulls back from their shuttle to head back into the capital. Hunter, Cham, and the others run to escape as a squad of troopers move towards the capital. The two forces clearly on trajectories to collide. The troopers form a battle line outside the main doors to the capital. Inside, Hunter and Cham are on the other side of the door, but Hauser stops them. He tells them it's a trap. A squad of troopers is outside waiting. On one side of the door, Crosshair's deadly aim and a squad of troopers. On the other side, Hunter, Cham, and Hauser. Gobi challenges Hauser's intentions, and Hauser reiterates his loyalty to his friend Cham and Ryloth. What the Empire is doing is wrong. He tells them all the exits are blocked. Eleni states they can use Senator Todd's personal shuttle. She pleads with Hauser to come with them. The Empire will not be kind to him, but Hauser is a warrior. He will not leave his men. Cham, Hunter, and the others leave, but Hunter turns around to see Hauser. He watches as Hauser puts his helmet back on and approaches the door where he is about to reveal himself to his squad. Hunter pauses, and again we see some great nonverbal storytelling. Hunter knows he's observing a true warrior, someone who leads, knows when to have restraint, and knows when to have empathy and compassion, and knows when to fight with everything he's got, and he's not afraid to confront the consequences for these actions. Back at the refinery, Hunter tells Tech they can break off. Hera and Tech fly their ships into orbit and onto hyperspace. At the capital door, Crosshair tells his team to stay in place. The door opens, but only Hauser stands there. It's an old-fashioned western showdown, but this one isn't going to end with blaster fire. It will end with words. Hauser appeals to his men. They came to Raloth to free it from the Separatists, but now they are targeting the very people they swore to protect. He throws his gun down in defiance of this new cause and asks who will stand with him. Several troopers join him, but not all of them. Crosshair orders the traitors to be arrested. As Crosshair lowers his guard, Senator Todd's shuttle escapes the city. From inside Senator Todd's ship, Hunter looks down at the scene unfolding. Though he doesn't say it, he knows a true warrior made a sacrifice for their escape. On Ord Mantel, Eleni gives Hunter their payment, but Hunter refuses. He states that they're the ones that will need it. But we know that throughout the episode, Hunter has struggled with putting his team at risk. Omega got him to empathize with Hera and help her. Then he watched as Hauser sacrificed his own freedom for the Bad Batch and the Syndulas. Taking any payment would lack honor at this point. Cham tells Hunter a war is coming and they must organize. But Hunter states that he has his own people to take care of. He looks at his team of Tech, Echo, Wrecker, and Omega. But we know that it's much more than that. Whether he knows it or not, their mission is also the redemption of the Clone Army too. Omega and Hera say goodbye and Hera tells Omega that she's sure they'll see each other again. Back at the refinery, Rampart tells Crosshair that he underestimated Clone Force 99. Crosshair requests permission to hunt Bad Batch down, to which Rampart states, Granted. This episode was well-crafted and complex, with great non-verbal storytelling, sub-stories, subplot characters, and numerous foils that showed the growth of the main characters. Hauser's inner turmoil between the direction the new empire is going and the history he had with Ryloth is telling, not just with his words, but with the emotions on his face. And the struggle by Hunter and Rampart to show empathy is epic. I'm pretty sure none of the production team are former military, but the story they crafted is spot on to me. I can completely relate to the Bad Batch and their journey. Hunter is battle-hardened, but he's learning to become a true warrior at this point, and a man. As stated earlier, this episode belongs to Omega, and I think it was her best episode yet. She drives the mission. She understands that she cannot do this on her own, 
and she paints a picture for the guys of what mission accomplishment looks like. And for that, she gets the Bad Batch to take the mission. With Hera as her foil, Omega shows how far she's come since Order 66. Hera's need is also an opportunity for Omega to come up with her own mission and plan. We can see that she has been paying attention to how the guys operate, and she's learning to speak their language. Her development as a person and a character is fantastic. For the last 11 episodes, we've seen Bad Batch grow within their enhancements and learn to adapt to their enhancements to this new post-war galaxy, but they have much to learn still, and Omega's presence is part of that learning process. She brought in the element of femininity, and as we are seeing, her femininity and their masculinity are working together to form a formidable team. Through this, Omega is learning to take risks, control her emotions, and trust her squad. The guys are learning empathy and when to ramp it up and down. I don't think the production staff intended for this to come across, but I think that it is inherent in good storytelling. When writers and directors create characters and stories that reflect true life, they will always be compelling. Their choice to place a female child into the mix with a bunch of battle-hardened men was always headed to a clash between femininity and masculinity. And just like any good marriage, the only way to move forward in a positive way is to challenge each other and make the effort to develop one's femininity and masculinity. And to bring this back to the theme, in the end, we get a sense for what a masculine warrior looks like and what a feminine warrior looks like. They are two different things, but they work together. And now for the questions of Bad Batch's overall mission and purpose. Will Clone Force 99 fix their own inhibitor chips? This question was answered in Episode 7, Battle Scars. Will Clone Force 99 get back Crosshair and fix his inhibitor chip? It's starting to look like Crosshair will not return to his brothers. He is taking several steps to both remove his love for them and to take them out. At this point, it is not looking good. Will Clone Force 99 save their brothers? In this episode, Hauser represents their clone brothers, and it's apparent that there is hope for them. And last, will Clone Force 99 reconcile the clones with the Jedi? This issue was not addressed in this episode. Thanks for watching, and if you like the content in today's video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, share, or subscribe.